Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrac, in our house today, dans la maison, Eddie Turner. Let me introduce Eddie, good, good friend, and then we'll get into some uh, lines of questioning, certainly around the spectrum, the orbit, the galaxy of leadership. Eddie Turner, in-demand, Harvard-trained leadership development expert who works with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. He's changing the face of leadership and helping to create better workplaces and a better world as a principal consultant and executive coach at Linkage, which is a Sherm company. But he's more than that. Eddie's a significant experience driving digital transformation, systems integration, and developing leaders at all levels of many different organizations, including major corporations, and get this list, like Pepsi, Deloitte, GE, Dell, Apple, the NFL, WNBA, amongst a bunch of others. The list is too long, Eddie. He's one of the top 25 thought leaders in leadership by Thinkers360, the power list of the top 200 biggest voices in leadership by Leaders Hum, and one of the top 25 mentors in the globe by the International Federation of Learning and Development. Eddie has appeared pretty much everywhere, including the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Fox News, PBS, NPR, and ABC, and he also serves as a frequent national media commentator. He's the author of the internationally best-selling book, which we'll talk a bit about today, 140 Simple Messages to Guide Emerging Leaders, and he's one of 52 co-authors of The Light Book. Eddie studied leadership and organizational behavior at Northwestern University. He earned a Bachelor of Science. He also holds an executive certificate in public leadership from the Harvard Kennedy School. Eddie, such a treat to have you today in the shop. Let's start first, if you don't mind, with sort of background and origin. And so um, what has motivated you, I suppose, right, to get into and to enter this field of leadership? You know, if you're a leadership accelerator, was there some sort of defining moment or something that influenced you that propelled you to both study research and then uh, give back to so many leaders that you've been able to work with so far in your career? Indeed. First of all, Dan, thank you for having me on your program. What an honor to be here with you. In answer to your question, the pivotal point for me was I was working in information technology I was good at what I did, loved information technology, but along the way, working for the best corporations and seeing the best leaders, I started to form an opinion about leadership. Mm. And at one of those organizations, General Electric, at the time, I wanted to get a promotion. And my leader said, we'd like to do more with you, but you don't have a degree. In IT, I didn't need a degree in those days. Yeah. And so that sent me on a quest to decide what was the school I would go to to get this degree. I selected a few different options, and none of them were good enough, according <laughs> to uh, the manager that I took it to. He says, no, you're either going to go to University of Chicago or Northwestern, because that's all we're going to respect, because I lived in Chicago at the time. So right. I selected Northwestern, and Northwestern had a program that they were just launching, Leadership and Organization Behavior. And it was not something I would have selected, but it was the first time they launched a program that adult learners complete their degree at Northwestern. So I was a part of that inaugural program. So the leadership component was appealing to me because of what I had been seeing at GE and what I'd studied at GE. GE's Crotonville, they had programs and I had attended one. And it was the most fascinating program I had ever gone to. I, I learned so much about managing and leading and influencing skills that I did not know about. Huh. But studying this program in Northwestern allowed me to go, obviously, into a more empirical uh, research program and digging deep. And it gave me a new lens to look at leadership through. It gave me a new application of leadership. And there are a few times that a person has the opportunity to work for a corporation that actually is featured in much of the literature. So at that time, of course, every Harvard Business Review article, uh, a lot of the case studies, things were focused on GE. So being able to go to school, learn this content of the place I'm working for <laughs> and applying it in real time is very, very helpful to me. So that was the start of it. Isn't that so interesting? So 
as you're applying some of your Northwestern newfound leadership, knowledge, skill, and application, did you ever come or were there instances where there were crossroads, you know, maybe uh, sandpaper or friction where there was the Jack Welshian way of how uh, the organization might have operated with some of the theory and perhaps differentiating opinion on how leadership ought to be applied? Like, were you ever in some sort of crossroad or consternation, you know, um, uh, knuckles knuckling yourself through certain situations. Absolutely. Everyone, I should say everyone, that's a bad word to use, right? Uh, a generalization. Mm -hmm. Many leaders patterned themselves after Jack Welch. He was considered at the time the CEO of the century. Yeah. He was the, 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 the measurement people used for what success looks like. And therefore that tough in your face, style of leadership, command and control, was one that was modeled by many of the great leaders. And uh, it was considered that for a corporation, if you got a GE leader, you were really getting something. It was like getting the top pick in the draft in sports. <laughs> but I always had a different opinion about what I was seeing. Yes, I saw this uh, unfold in front of me, but there was always this part of me that says, there, there must be a better way of doing this. This isn't mm. always what's right. Now, over time, that has been proven true. People look back and there's many books being written about that leadership style, especially now in the 21st century. But my studies at Northwestern led me to study people like Daniel Goldman mm. and his work around emotional intelligence, what that looks like and feels like and the temperature you can create as a leader. Study other great leaders like uh, Larry Rabiniak and, and, and so many others. But if we just took the one component about emotional intelligence that says you can be a strong leader, but there are different facets of leadership. The landmark article that he wrote in the, in the Harvard Business Review, I'd say it was probably back in 2001, I still refer to that, where I know nothing about golf, but I know enough to understand <laughs> the illustration he used about leadership a leader's needing to have a leadership style that's like a, a set of golf clubs. Yeah. That you don't have one style that you always use. You know, I I know enough to know that if I'm going to start off, I need the driving. I need the biggest club in the bag. And you tee off and you hit that thing as hard as you can. But then at a certain point, maybe you need that sand wedge. Hopefully you're not that bad that you need it. But then you get a little further down, you need a different type of club. And finally at the end, you wouldn't pull out the driver. You're mm. going to pull out that putter and do it nice and soft. And that's how he liked his leadership. A leader who's always driving, driving, hitting hard and swinging on people, <laughs> that's that's corrosive. And that is not certainly what will work in the 21st century with a new, different generation of employees in, in the workforce. No, sometimes you might need to do some correction with a sandwich or a, pull out another club, but in a great number of cases, a soft putter is what's needed. And so he gives specific labels to each of those leadership styles and says that the most effective leaders, they will lead with a dominant style, but they'll employ these other styles as necessary to mm -hmm. be the most effective leader. So you've been out of GE for several years now, and I'm sure you've come to some of those reconciliation moments in your head, right, about how things were done and how they ought to be done. And so where did this passion for developing leaders and emerging leaders um, kind of emanate from for you? Was it within the the GE world? You're like, I don't want to be like that. I want to help leaders do something different. Like how, how what, what shaped you, I guess, to become Eddie Turner? Uh, it can't be, I mean, I love Goldman as well in the EQ piece, but it can't be just an article. There's, there's a period of transformations i would argue that you've probably gone through to get to a point where you're like hot damn this is exactly how i'm going to be known and this is how and who i want to help within that journey of mine sure during my program of study at northwestern where i was able to go deeper then my my my, my love of leadership as a discipline was probably nurtured but then there was one gentleman who came to campus who gave a a lecture. He's our guest lecturer for the evening. And what he talked about at the time, he was the vice president of global talent development uh, at the largest executive search firm in the world. 
uh, hydrate struggles. His name was Bob T. And what he said, it was fascinating to me. Hmm. And I sent him a simple thank you note, uh, thanking him for speaking to us. I wasn't expecting anything to come from that. But Bob responded by saying, thank you for your note. If you would like to learn more, let's have coffee one day. And I took him up on his invitation. And that coffee led to more coffee time. It led to him uh, hiring me as a consultant as, as I left GE. And I spent a year working under his leadership where he taught me so much about the business of learning, talent development, and leadership. That is what set me on my quest. Later on, I'd go on to study it further because as I left IT, I was typecast. Uh, mm. No HR department wanted to hire me because they saw this IT experience. Oh, like, no. Why on earth would we hire you to do learning and development in IT? Uh, learning and development, you're an IT professional. So I had a hard time breaking in. So I applied what I had applied in my IT career. I started to pursue certification after certification after certification to prove that I'm serious about this new area that I want to focus on. Uh, I still had a tough road, but eventually I got an opportunity and I was able to start to uh, to work in learning and development. And then I went back to uh, organizations like Harvard. I completed my executive cert certificate in uh, public leadership. And there, of course, being able to study under the greatest professors in the world, uh, it was even further cemented, that passion. And then I had new tools, of course, that I would use. And that uh, I spent uh, probably about 10 years uh, on my own uh, doing consulting. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my clients uh, extended an offer to me to join them. And so that's kind of what you mentioned at the beginning. I spent some time working for Linkage, who later was purchased by Sherm. And I uh, spent about a year working for them uh, after the acquisition, but now I'm back independent on my own. But at every phase, I have... I, I'm attracted to organizations that have leadership as a center of what they do and have leadership frameworks. I, I'm enamored with different leadership frameworks for the same reason that Daniel Goldman says the the tool bag, uh, the golf bag of different golf clubs. I like different leadership frameworks that I can apply for different clients as needed in different scenarios. I love that. Well, why don't we dig into that a little bit? Um, so Eddie, if you were to sort of define how you see uh, effective leadership today, what what would you suggest are kind of the critical components of a of an impactful leadership that is not only emotionally intelligent, but obviously organizations, whether they're for profit, not for profit, public sector, are running a business. So, you know, performance has to achieve goals. So tell me a bit about your definition of, of what I might just call effective leadership these days. Effective leadership these days encompasses uh, a layer of flexibility while still having a solid grounding in a principled framework. Mm. I'd like to cite Dr. Ron Heifetz on that, because Dr. Ron Heifetz is one of the world's foremost authorities on leadership. And he comes from a family of uh, doctors. In fact, his father created the Heifetz clip that is used to save people's lives with their heart. Uh, he, would, he himself was a surgeon, but he, I was, uh, decided, he decided to leave medicine and surgery and come over to teaching leadership. And he's done that for the last 40 years. He's just a brilliant man. Mm. But in, in all of that, what he taught us is, in, in this, this room full of experts from around the world, he says that just like our physician does not operate without a framework, whenever they go to diagnose us, diagnosis without a specific framework is malpractice. They don't mm. skip certain steps. And he said, likewise, as leaders, you operate with out a framework at your own peril. It's malpractice as a leadership development professional. He said all frameworks are flawed because they're created by humans. But you need a framework. Otherwise, you're shooting from the hip. You're just guessing. And so I believe that every organization needs a framework that they're going to operate from. Every leader themselves must have their own framework that they're operating from. Interesting. Okay. So 
Now I want to try and connect the dot because that opened up another kind of proverbial leadership worms for me. And that is from a background perspective and knowing with your pedigree and experience, you know, you've been in uh, digital transformations, you've been in IT implementations, you've been in the IT sector for a lot of your career. And, and so have I. So I come from you know, the era of, you know, the MCSEs, the CompTIA A pluses, all of the Novell CNAs, like you name all of that stuff. I've got them. I pursued all. a like, lot of those. Yeah. So there's <laughs> like a, in a certificate drawer back there, there's about 15 of them. What, what parallels do you see that you've learned and you've actually, uh, Eddie brought with you from digital transformation and, and how, it works or how it doesn't and the leadership lessons there that you've been able to actually port into Eddie Turner of uh, the year 2024. Well, let's start with, let's, let me use one framework and then fill that framework in by answering your question about what I've, what I've brought over. Sure. Uh, so one framework is uh, one created by Mark Hannum. Uh, Mark Hannum uh, wrote the book, Become. And in that book, Become, it starts in the center of who we are becoming as a leader. Mm. No one knows who we are as a leader until we then speak and we act. And now they see it manifest about who we are internally. So every leader has to work on what they're putting inside themselves. In information technology, you are taught immediately when you enter the field. You cannot get stagnant. You cannot get rusty. Technology changes too fast. Moore's law kicks in about yeah. processors. Everything changes. In fact, it doubles. And yeah. then it goes exponentially every six months. And I've been out of it for a little while, so I can't use exact stats, <laughs> but it goes quickly. <laughs> right? So this Moore's law, this theory, it is really true. And so you must continually, continuously update your skills, challenge yourself. You cannot get complacent. You cannot rest on your laurels. And so as a leader myself, I try to apply that. And that means investing in myself. I set aside a certain percentage of my income every year to take formal training of some type, not trying to rest on what I learned 20 years ago. And that's what I encourage the leaders that I work with. Continuously develop yourself. I wrote an article in Forbes at one point where I said, don't wait for the company to invest in you. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that because I worked for a corporation and they didn't give us a budget for any training. So I always paid to go to different conferences and train myself. And uh, you know, someone said to me, why do you do that? Why do you keep paying for training? I said, why should I wait for the company to invest in me? I believe in me. So I am investing in myself. And I, I like it to what we did when we uh, all left school and we went and got degrees. We had to pay for our degree ourselves to prepare ourselves for employment. So why would I not continue to prepare myself for employment in this organization and promotions in the organization? So that was my approach. So this, that first layer of that framework that Mark uh, produced is about who we become. Mm. And then it moves into what we say, how we inspire other people. We inspire people by not just what we say, but as my grandmother used to say, uh, don't preach me a sermon, show me why. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So how, what we do, that inspires people. And, and and that gives hope to people who are not extroverts. Because sometimes people say, I'm not an extrovert. I'm not a great speaker. Who could I inspire? And some of the best leaders inspire people by their silent moments, by the way they handle things, their dignity, their grace. I did an assessment on one leader. And one of the feed pieces of feedback that came back on her is someone wrote, I learned how to be a leader by watching her. So it's about not just her words, but her actions. Then if you've inspired people, now they're engaged. Mm -hmm. They're engaged. They will do what you want them to do. They will heed your call to action. And more importantly, they will do it without you being around. So many leaders, they can only control people when they're there threatening them. And that's what we saw in the leadership of old, that command control model. Then when they're engaged, uh, Amy Edmondson says, as we learned and saw at uh, her at Thicker Shifty there in London, 
Uh, she's the one who created the phrase psychological safety. I don't know how I did not know that, and I've been using that phrase forever, but she created that phrase. So when people are psychologically safe, then psychology tells us that their amygdala is not hijacked. If the amygdala is not hijacked, now they're not in that fight, flight, or freeze mode. You know, hey, I, I got to put my dukes up and fight at this place I'm working at. Yeah. Or, oh, my goodness, I'm just, I'm just frozen. I'm not going to do anything. I'm scared to do anything. Or I'm just going to leave. I got to get out of here. When they're not in that mode, now they're freed to innovate. They become innovative. They can be creative. That creative portion of the brain is unleashed. And they can bring forth those new ideas that organizations need. When that happens, then the final piece of that framework kicks in. You can achieve. Hmm. You can put points on a board, and you put points on a board legitimately, not because you took shortcuts. And now we see you on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, right? You did it the right way, and that means it's sustainable, and it will last for a much, much longer period of time. So when you're thinking through today's leaders and you're working with them and it's not a generation or age question, I'm just wondering, Eddie, where do you see that we're getting it right? And where do you see that there is still sort of that gap analysis? And I go, I go back to sort of your digital transformation days, right? We always looked at, you know, where are we? What's above the line, below the line? What can we roll out? What's the training and um, development plan to get users using this new ERP, this tech, this whatever we have? I'm just curious for you today, um, what, where, how would you assess the Delta gap ultimately of, of where leadership stands with leaders? I was a part of a program with uh, a member of our 100 coaches community, Dr. Uh, Tom Colvitz. Hmm. And Dr. Colvitz uses a phrase that I really like. He says that we have an inverted pyramid when it comes to leadership development in organizations. And by that, he means that we spent a lot of money at the top. <laughs> I remember being at one organization, I discovered that, oh, wow, we actually do send people for full programs to this prestigious university. But you didn't know it. <laughs> you would never know it. Right. But so a lot of money is spent at the top. And the further down you go in an organization, less money is spent. But really, you need to flip that. Because if you can develop the people at the bottom of the organization, now the genius can bubble up, right? So organizations that invest in a learning culture do very, very well, where learning is embedded in every aspect of the employee interaction, mm. where learning is celebrated. Now, the antithesis happens far too often. We don't want to promote learning because that means you don't know something. And we shame you for not knowing something. And so, therefore, what you will do is hide the fact you don't know. Oh, and you exactly. won't tell anyone. And then you create problems. We see on the news weekly now, one organization, that because they hid errors, now literally, mm. it's being exposed. And people's lives have been in jeopardy yeah. because of that. Isn't that interesting? Because it goes back to several hallmarks of what makes a leader, right? And whether it's leader of self or leader of others or both, you know, we're mm -hmm. we're talking about transparency, trust, authenticity, collaboration, uh, e evoking emotion because we're not robots or actually human beings. Mistakes yes. happen, but where's that tuition value of the mistake? Where can we learn from that? I mean. I am the recovering chief learning officer, Eddie. So you are speaking and preaching as uh, as your grandmother used to say, right? Ultimately to the choir. So speaking of which, um, the the book, 140 Simple Messages to Guide Emerging Leaders, um, you've got 140 aha zingers in there. And I wanted to capture a couple of them and sort of get your, all right, and kind of almost like, uh, rapid fire. Let's let's see what Eddie further thinks about some of these. 
So let's okay. start. And <laughs> now I, you got to test my memory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll give you the number and I'll read it. And then I'll just say, hey, what, what more do you mean by this? I guess. So, aha, uh -huh, number four, I loved. You're either born a leader or you're not. This is what many people have been taught. The reality is far different. I believe that you, Eddie, I believe everyone has the capacity to be a leader. Give me more. That was based on literally just so much I've always heard people say and how people would uh, basically uh, put you in categories. Mm. Uh, for many years, if you weren't a certain height, you weren't a certain uh, color, you weren't yeah. a certain gender, it was assumed you couldn't lead. It was assumed that you couldn't lead if you didn't have even a certain amount of education. In other words, if you aren't a college graduate, you're not a leader. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be further from the truth. If you're an introvert, if you're too quiet, you'll be by all these different stereotypes of what they said doesn't make a leader. But the research shows that no. In fact, uh, I have to change the statement on that now that you now that you, hear, that you show me what I wrote. <laughs> I, said, I think everyone has the ability to be a leader. I listened to Jim Cousins speak, uh, one of the foremost authorities on leadership, who wrote the book, The Leadership Circle. Yeah. Uh, so leadership circle, leadership challenge, the leadership, leadership circle is the assessment, leadership yeah, challenge. challenge yeah. It's in its seventh edition now. And Barry Posner is his uh, co-author, and they've been studying this for 30, 35 years. And they have a point in the book that says that uh, only one in, I haven't read it in a minute. I want to say one in a million cannot lead. I believe that's the stat. Only one in a million. Hmm. Everyone else has some capacity to lead. That's what their research bore out. And therefore, if it's only a rare individual who literally cannot lead, that means there's hope for all of us. <laughs> now, it may be like a can of soda. You know, maybe some of us have, you know, the ability to, to be a 12 ounce. Some, maybe it's only six <laughs> ounces, right? But we all have some capacity to lead. And therefore, it behooves us to discover what our capacity is. And as an executive coach, that's one of the journeys I take my uh, clients on. And if you are at a certain level, how can we build that level? Can we build capacity? And that's where uh, the work of the great leaders I've studied under, especially Dr. Ron Heifetz comes in at, you know, that's one of the, the, the core principles that he's taught and his theory of adaptive leadership. And an adaptive leadership, the ability to understand that there are just certain times that for every leader, there is no clear answer. And, mm. and, and in some leadership frameworks, people will feel like, okay, I'm a failure. Mm. Whereas adaptive leadership says no, because this is a new problem, it requires new learning. Going back to the idea that learning should be celebrated and the fact of not knowing is not a reason to shame someone. The greatest problems that we face have required adaptive solutions and not fixed or technical mm -hmm. solutions. We all just came through COVID. That's one great example of an adaptive problem. We hadn't seen that something like that in a generation. We, it required new learning. It required new skills. It required new uh, vaccines. <laughs> yeah. And so that took all of us on a journey of adaptive leadership. Well, speaking of adaptive leadership, AHA number six actually is one of those as well. It's another zinger. You write, Eddie... My dad always taught me to be a leader, not a follower. Many years later, I learned a leader can, in fact, be both. Do tell. Yeah, so yesterday was the anniversary of my dad's death. Mm. And so I've been quite contemplative about my dad over the last uh, you know, few hours, you know, three or four days. Mm hmm so that when you read that, that just kind of just uh, just gets me a little bit. But yeah, so my dad would always yell at us and talk about, don't be a follower, don't be a follower. Because be a follower is bad. Uh, be a leader, think differently, act differently. And what I learned later on through studies at uh, Northwestern and other places is that the best leaders are followers because they understand at times you have to kind of fall behind. A little bit of the pack as birds do when they're flying south somebody has to uh, lead but they kind of fall back and they rotate going back and forth and so at times as a leader we have to understand that we don't know everything 
And when we don't know everything, that means we must look to someone else who does on our team and be willing to admit, hey, you know, Dan, you're the expert on this area. Tell us what you think we should be doing. Now, as a leader, I'm still going to make the final decision, but I'm trusting in you because you've got the expertise. And that's okay. Uh, we put this false, uh, uh, the, the, this big burden on leaders of the 21st century to know everything. We are in the knowledge economy. It is impossible and unrealistic that a 21st century leader can know everything. So they must be experts in being able to understand and trust their team and not themselves. So that's one aspect of the, this, that this needs to do that, uh, be a follower as a great leader. I the other component it. is, as, as, as great leaders, we all tend to look to someone else in our model of leadership, be it a, a deity. You know, I'm getting ready to give a speech, and one of the people I'm, I'm, I'm citing is Mohatness Gandhi. Gandhi, you know, uh, we're looking at a, a great leader of, of, of history. We're looking at a deity. Or we're looking at uh, a, a, a political figure who we, we might model ourselves after or a, a great person from uh, history. Or, 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 our, or our community, or even one of our relatives, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like me for my dad sometimes. So we are all still following in this quest of leadership. We're following someone. And even if we're taking a bit of pieces here and there and making an amalgam of who we're going to be, we're still following somebody's footsteps. This is gorgeous. It really is. Um, to uh stay in the contemplation circle of your father and clearly love there was also another um homage to him in aha number 11 and you write my father and uncles were the first people to teach me the importance of visual leadership they taught me the importance of a good suit and shine shoes in presenting myself as a professional i'd love to hear additional thoughts on that because uh, you are literally singing to the choir on this particular one <laughs> with me. Yes, visual leadership, the idea that uh, you lead by how you show up. You lead by the nonverbals, and people judge us on how we look. They judge us on how we appear. And uh, today we call that a fancy phrase, uh, executive presence. So at the time when I was growing up, that meant we dressed a certain way if we wanted to be acceptable in certain circles. Uh, uh, here in 2024, things have changed. It's not necessarily required to wear a suit. In fact, uh, in a great number of cases, you never need a suit. <laughs> uh, so right. it may not be that you always need a suit, but is everything well cared, cared for and, and well arranged? Whatever we're going to wear. If it's a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, you know, are they clean? Are they tidy? You know, that's you know, just kind of how, how they brought me up and raised me, and that's what they bottled. I love that. Okay. Just a couple more, and then we'll hear uh, where we can hear more about you. Um, Aha number 53. It didn't catch me by surprise, but it, I think, almost... Um, it gets lost on people because of the words you're using. Not, not that you wrote it incorrectly i'm talking about society and kind of thinking through what these words mean so that's why i want to bring it up and then sort of okay. uh infer what you what we're both getting at because i agree so you write number 53 lead without authority influence it, sorry let me do that again lead without authority influence without power it's, yes it's provocative and almost antithetical so tell me a bit more what you got what you mean there Yes, uh, that is Dr. Heifetz's teaching. And I wrote that, I don't know if I put his name under that quote, but I wrote that uh, just thinking what I had learned from Dr. Heifetz. Uh, this idea of leading without authority. I had always thought that you have to have a position in an organization. Well, I'm not the manager. I'm not the president. But I started to realize that in a great number of cases, I've seen a lot of people who didn't have a title just get up and do what needed to be done. <laughs> yeah, someone else should be taking care of this, but I'm just going to do it. And the moment you do that, you're exercising leadership. And oftentimes, if you've done that enough and other people recognize it, people start to say, well, this is the person who's really doing it already. And you end up with that authority. And so Dr. Heifers uh, draws a distinction between informal and formal authority. Mm -hmm. And some of the greatest 
changes in an organization, greatest changes in history, happened from people who had no authority. But they used it and eventually had that formal authority. And then uh, the other part of that was leading, uh, with, with, what was it, lead without power? Yeah, you, uh, let me get it right, uh, influence without power, yeah. Ah, yes, influence without power. So yes, the the, the ability to move someone to act in the way that you want them to act when you have no power over them. In other words, in an organization, especially today where we're interconnected, you need to influence other stakeholders and other departments, other divisions, other parts of the world. And they don't report to you. So they don't have to do what you want. Uh, therefore, you must learn how to use the skills of influencing. And influencing is a dignified, a professional way of being able to move another person and pull them into your direction hmm. where they want to do it. And sometimes, even when that's not the case, that they want to do it, that's where the, the, the beauty of uh, the exchange comes in. Hmm. And uh, one of the courses I took at Harvard was uh, the power of negotiation. And I'll never forget one of the phrases, if I don't remember anything else from that program, I can't remember the professor's name who said it. <laughs> uh, but he, he said, in life, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. Mm. And I will never forget that phrase. And it is so very true. And so in this in this act of influencing, sometimes a person won't do it because they want to do it, but they will do it because of how you negotiate it and that you received it for that reason. Well, this doesn't sound like a negotiation because I'm going to force you to respond to one last quip of yours. Uh, in the book, you pay homage um, uh, to Dr. Willie Jolie, uh, who wrote, uh, it only takes a minute to change your life. And the, the 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 quote here that you use kind of remind me a little bit about LL Cool J, don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. But uh, Jolie's point is a setback is a set up for a comeback. And I haven't seen that before, Eddie, and I love it because it reminds me of perseverance and resilience. Um, but tell me a bit about that. A setback is a setup for a comeback. Yes, Dr. Willie Jolly, is just, he's one of the just the most amazing people I've ever met. Uh, one of the top, he's a Hall of Fame speaker in our National Speakers Association, and he has a program on Sirius XM. And that's his trademark phrase. And I put that in my book because when I'm talking to clients or or uh, others, young people especially, I, I I cite him on that because it is so true. When we have setbacks, so often w w we might want to just crumble, just lay on the ground as it were. But he says that the setback is your set up for your comeback. Yeah. So you're going to learn from that mistake and, and retool. It's your setup. And now when you come back, you're coming back with, uh, as Dr. Edie Greenblatt and our, our group would say, uh, with the, uh, the the leading researcher on, on resiliency, you're going to come back resilient and you're going to bounce back like a rubber band, not just bounce back, but bounce back stronger. And so that's why I cite that phrase from Dr. Willie Jolly, because I just think that too often uh, we might adopt a defeatist mentality when things occur. And uh, we need a coach sometimes to help us or a loved one to help us realize that uh, as, as an older woman in, in, uh, in my religious life used to say, that failure uh, is not fatal. You're a gorgeous human being, Eddie Turner. Uh, thank you for this. It's expanded my brain almost infinitely. Where uh, can listeners and viewers find out more about you and your great pedigree of work? Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, visit AskEddieTurner.com. Dot com. I've got it down here on the screen. I spell Eddie, E-D-D-I-E. AskEddieTurner.com. There you'll find uh, links to all my social profiles. I invite you to connect with me online. Uh, my phone number and email address are listed there. Uh, I'm available for speaking engagements, keynote speeches, executive coaching, and uh, leadership consulting. You are a gem, a uh, finely polished diamond, Eddie. Thank you so much for this. Uh, again, I uh, can't can't um, thank you enough, but learn so much and keep doing what you're doing. We we definitely need more Eddie Turners in this world. Dad, thank you. What a pleasure. 
All right, folks, that was another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontchfrac, in the house, Eddie Turner. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next time around.